Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? Feeling better this morning. Got some more energy this morning. We're going about we're about to dip into the book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews. Very strong book. Very strong, very informative, and in certain places can be very easy to misunderstand. Let's see what we can discover in the first chapter. Verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So this is the last verse in that chapter. Now I believe the following chapter continues. We'll get to there in a second. Let's go up here. So you have to go up kind of far on this one, more than five verses, because he's he's making a very interesting speech here. In fact, we're just going to start at the beginning because... It's to get the proper context, you have to. This is one of those instances in the Bible where it takes more than five verses to get the full context. You've got to go back to the beginning of the thought, and that's all the way up at the first verse. The supremacy of God's Son. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has, in these last days, spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds. So we're getting John 1, which we're about to start the works of John here next day or two. He's confirming what John says. All things came through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And nothing was made that wasn't made through him. So he's, Hebrews is confirming this. He has appointed heir of all things, who, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. When you see Jesus, you see, you've seen God. We've all seen God through Jesus Christ. And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had said, or sorry, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Notice it says purged, past tense. What did he do that? He did that on the cross. When he had, by himself, purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has, by inheritance, obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son." He never said that to any of the angels. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. They're telling you what that verse means. That, that's a verse from the Old Testament. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. That was God talking to God. That was God talking to Jesus. So even God confirms Jesus is God. Right there, Hebrews. I know a lot of people, especially Muslims, love to debate this. Well, Hebrews 1.8 tells you this is God. And then you go find, I believe that's, I believe that's Psalms is where that verse is found that he's quoting here in capitals. And I'm not 100% sure, but it's be, it'd be easy to find it if you Google it. Um, but this is God telling Jesus, calling Jesus he's God. So they're wrong, as usual. Verse 9, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. He's constantly quoting the Old Testament here. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the works are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will fold them up and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? See, the angels are sent to help us. The angels have a different position than we do. 
They have a different position than God does. They have a different position than Christ does. Very different. <laughs> they don't need salvation. They're elect angels. They're already in heaven. But they're here to help us because we're going to inherit salvation. A lot of people misunderstand this. Now let's check. Yeah, the, the thought does continue in the sec next chapter. So we'll read a couple of verses of chapter 2. Warning against neglecting salvation. So the thought, let's go back. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Now you remember this whole chapter. Now we go, therefore, verse 1 of, of chapter 2, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. So if he's talking to believers here and he's saying there's a possibility of them drifting away if we don't pay attention, that means it could happen. That means they, this is something they were dealing with back then. Lest we drift away. Well, how is that possible? It's possible. Look at the world today. Look at what people are doing. People that for all outside appearances were right where they should have been. And now look what they are. Wandering away in every form of false doctrine. Verse 2, for the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? So what is he talking about here? For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. There were angels that received reward for what they did. If they receive their reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? See, the angels have no recourse, the ones that abandoned God and turned against his commandments. Those angels that went with Satan, they have no recourse. They, they're, they're, there's no, no help for them. But how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And we won't. And yet people today do. They, they neglect this. Let us not neglect it. That's why, that's why we're here, to not neglect it. But instead to stay in it. There, we're giving more earnest heed to the things we have heard. This is the problem with people today is they don't read the Bible. They don't listen to the word. That's why they wander. They have nothing to keep them anchored. This word is the, is the rope that ties us to the cornerstone. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God, also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. How can we possibly ignore this? How can we ignore it if we have this much going for us. Well, we can't, and we shouldn't. But today, as is the case with most, they don't listen to the word. They don't pay attention. They don't read. You have to be reading. This is the thing that was impressed upon me day one in this ministry. January 2019, when I put out my first video, this is what was impressed upon me. Tell them to read, read, read. Because the secrets, the answers, the truth is contained in his word. Not in me, not in anyone else in his word. It is so important that you would be shocked. I know I was. When you try to get people to sit down and go through the scriptures with you. How easily they're distracted away from it. Or how they get off topic because they're focused on something that has nothing to do with the Bible. I sat in a Bible study one time. This is, this is one of the ones that made me quit going to the Bible study at my last church. And a person in the group was stuck on one word. Could not get off of it. And I run into people all the time that they're, they're, they're stuck on definitions. One of my army buddies, he was stuck on a definition of the word rod. Well, why does it mean this and this and this and this? And I was like, because it's being used in different contexts. Here, it's for this purpose. But here, that rod is for something completely different. Yeah, but if the definitions are different, doesn't that show that the Bible is under... I'm, and I, I, got, I got upset with him because he kept going on and going on. And I was like, okay, 
You can't base a denial of the scripture on the lack of an understanding on your part on the word used in these two instances. This word is used throughout the Bible and it falls under several different contexts and is being used in different ways. So the fact that there's a different definition for these words does not indicate that the Bible is wrong. It just indicates the Bible has more complex information than that. You're trying to base an entire denial of this being accurate on something that has nothing to do with it. You need to find something that's more tangible than this. He didn't want to talk anymore, which is fine. But I had to expose him for what he was doing. You're trying to deflect from the main focus here. And the main focus is this word has been proven true. I told him, we have over 26,000 documents that prove this word true. We have some of the original writings penned by the author from that time frame. We have people that, that had these scrolls on two different continents, 300 years or more apart, and they're a perfect match. You can't sit here and say this word is inaccurate. You can't go by the stories that people have told you because they're incorrect. But that's the problem today. No, everybody finds an excuse not to read the Bible. Instead of just saying, you know what, it's time for me to read it. And I hear this all the time when I, well, you used to. Not many people want to talk to me anymore. Yeah, I need to get my Bible out and dust it off. No, I, I tell them no. No, you don't. But didn't you just say I should be reading it more? Yeah. But you don't need it to get the Bible out and dust it off. You must get that Bible out and carry it with you everywhere you go. Especially today. And I'm not talking about something that you need to do later, which is what you just implied. You need to go do it right now. You must do it now. You must go get it and bring it and have it there with you. And start opening that up and reading it. You must dedicate time every single day. You must absorb what it's telling you. And you must respond to it and act on what it says. And you must believe it. There's no need to anything. You must do this. Anything else is a cop-out. So that's the kind of conviction some people need. To understand and realize the urgency of this. You're not going to understand it all, and that's fine. It never was meant for you to understand every bit of it. The Lord will give you knowledge as it comes, and as you need it, and as you can receive it. But every one of us must be reading this word. It is so important. If you want to remain outside of deception today, you've got to be in this word. Because if you know this word, they can't deceive you. I, I didn't say memorize. If you know this word, they can't deceive you. Because I can't memorize it. If you know this word, they cannot deceive you. Angels are the unseen attendants of the saints of God. They bear us up in their hands lest we dash our foot against a stone. That's from uh, Psalms or Proverbs. Loyalty to their Lord leads them to take a deep interest in the children of his love. Remember, the Bible also says when we preach, we're preaching to angels. Every church, angels sit in there if it's a church preaching truth. They rejoice over the return of the prodigal to the father's house below, and they welcome the advent of the believer to the king's palace above. You know, I told a pastor that one time because he was talking about, he goes, you know, he goes, if, everybody, if, people, if nobody ever came to this church, he goes, I would still be here preaching. I was like, but it wouldn't be empty. Just because people aren't here doesn't mean it's empty. Angels sit here too. See, the Bible talks about that. The Bible talks about how the angels... Follow us around and minister to us and watch over us. You better believe these chairs will be full of angels. You just won't see them. And then I told him, I said, and demons like to come here too. Those are the ones you can't help. And what that is, and I get indicators from certain scriptures that, that, that talk about this. What that is, is that's an indicator of people in your church. Some are bad, some are good. Some are saved, some aren't. It's interesting. A lot of people have had dreams and visions about that. So, since I keep getting off topic, let me go back, or off subject, let me go back and start again. Angels 
are the unseen attendants of the saints of God. They bear us up in their hands lest we dash our foot against a stone. Loyalty to their Lord leads them to take a deep interest in the children of his love. They rejoice over the return of the prodigal to his father's house below, and they welcome the advent of the believer to the king's palace above. See, the angels are very interested in this, as the Bible indicates. They don't understand how we can be saved. It's, it boggles their mind. It's a mystery to them. But the glory and the majesty of God doing this, they know because they're there in his presence. They pay attention to it. So this means something to them. Now, funny enough, they've been subjected to certain levels of corruption, too, because of what's happened. What Satan did did not just affect us. It affected them, too. That's why there's going to be a war in heaven. So they're very interested in what's going on here because, just like the Bible says, all of creation, and they're created, has been subjected to this against its will. And they await the revealing of the sons of God. Remember that verse? It's in the New Testament. They await the revealing of the sons of God because they know that they will be removed or they will be released from this futility when that happens. So all of creation is awaiting this. All of creation is waiting for that moment when the sons of God, that's us, are revealed. Because then they will be released from this prison they've been put in. That includes angels. In olden times, the sons of God were favored with their visible appearance. And at this day, although unseen by us, heaven is still open to the angels of God ascend and descend upon the Son of Man, that they may visit the heirs of salvation. Before anybody jumps on the bandwagon of going and watching these videos these people have been making where they're showing this stuff, there's heavy editing in these videos. Do not believe what they're showing you. I've, I was, I've been caught up with it in the past too. You cannot see them and God won't allow you to. Do not believe that garbage. They're, it's all fake stuff. They're making it because they think it's funny. They love to do that about the whole Nibiru Planet X garbage. There is no Planet X. There is no Nibiru. It doesn't exist. Never has. I don't know what their problem is, but they're, they're not Christians because they're not believing what the Word says. There is no indicator in the Bible about an exoplanet. Nothing. It's dumb. So don't believe those, those videos and stuff that you see. It's all very heavily edited. And if you take the time to look really close, you'll see the mistakes they make. I catch them every time. Seraphim still fly with live coals from off the altar to touch the lips of men greatly beloved. If our eyes could be opened, we should see horses of fire and chariots of fire about the servants of the Lord. And we have an instance in the Bible where that is listed. Specifically, a prayer of Elijah opened his eyes to see and he could see them. For we have come to an innumerable company of angels, innumerable, meaning you can't number them, it's impossible, I can get on a soapbox about Revelation 5 and Daniel 7 on this. I, I still think everybody's wrong, because if you look at this, it doesn't indicate those are angels. Innumerable company of angels who are all watchers and protectors of the seed royal. That's us. Spencer's line is no poetic fiction, where he sings, How oft do they with golden pinions cleave? The flitting skies like flying pursuivant against soul or sorry against foul fiends to aid us militant. The angels fight for us. To what dignity are the chosen elevated when the brilliant courtiers of heaven become their willing servitors? Into what communion are we raised since we have intercourse with spotless celestials? Don't misunderstand what that word means. In this, in this context, it means something different. With spotless celestials, how well are we defended since all the 20,000 chariots of God are armed for our deliverance? To whom do we owe all this? Let the Lord Jesus Christ be forever endeared to us. For through him we are made to sit in heavenly places far above principalities and powers. He, remember, our life is hid with him. He it is whose camp is round about them that fear him. He is the true Michael whose foot is upon the dragon. All hail Jesus, thou angel of Jehovah's presence. To thee this family offers its 
morning vows. So as we're reading stuff like this, make sure you understand what they're referring to. And a lot of times the words they're using them in a much different definition. Like the word intercourse immediately, because of our society today, immediately people think a sexual interaction of some kind. That's not what that is. That's why so many people out there misunderstand what the Bible says in a lot of places. Because they misunderstand the context a certain word is being used. You can do a light study into languages and understand this very easily. So that's not what that was referring to. It was referring to an interaction, which is what intercourse is. It's an interaction. How the interaction unfolds is up to debate, depending on what the conditions are. Anyway, this is why you have to read the word, because when you read the word, you start to understand this. That, that was a perfect example. You start to understand what's actually being referred to here. It takes time. You have to read it and read it and read it. Go over it. Let the Lord lead you. And when you do it, you do it prayerfully. What's going to end up happening is, is that the Holy Spirit is going to give you understanding. The angels are going to be there protecting you and watching over you. See, when you're in this word and your desire is to serve the Lord, your, your mind has been changed, your heart has been changed... Those entities who would seek to persuade you to believe something incorrectly cannot get to you because you are surrounded and covered by angels. See, there's a war happening right next to us in another realm, in the unseen realm. There's a war happening there. It's a battle constantly. And the angels that are fighting for us are keeping the demons away from us, are keeping those who would attack us away from us. Now, sometimes the Lord commands they step away and let it happen because it needs to happen because he's performing a purpose. Because he's going to use that to something. We have this evident in the story of Job. that it, it, For sure it can happen. The Lord told Satan, you can do anything you want to him, but don't kill him. Spare his life. And so he did. Then what happened? Ministering spirits came. Jesus, ministering spirits, were always around him. We have it recorded in the scriptures. That's these angels. So they're here. They're here around us at all times. You're never by yourself. You always have angels around you. If we would take the time to read the word and understand what it says, we would start to realize, and we would see it in our mind's eye, we would see it in our spirit, we start to realize what's going on, not only in us and from our perspective, but what's going on in the realm right next to us and in that perspective. Not fully, but to a degree that will help you understand what's happening. This word is perfect truth. It is to be revered as perfect truth. When we do that, when you come to that place, and this is why anytime I get into a discussion with somebody, I always bring it to the place where I end up asking them, do you believe the Bible is accurate or not? Do you believe the Bible's true? And we can get into semantics about accuracy. Of course, it's not perfectly accurate. No writing is, but that's beside the point. Is the subject matter true? Yes. If they say yes, we have a discussion because it's easy to show them what's in the scripture. If they say, no, I think there's issues with it. You can't have a discussion with that person. I learned this the hard way. You will never, ever in your inexhaustible efforts to try to convince them ever convince them otherwise. If they think there's something wrong with that book, there's nothing you can do for them. God has to intervene on their behalf. I've had people that have told me this and I'm like, then why do you have a Bible in your hand? Well, some of it's true, but how do you know which parts are? Well, I research. Research who? Do you go research from the author? Or do you do it from other people who've come up with their own opinions? See, your problem is, you can't accept something as truth. Because in your mind, nothing is true. So you carrying that book and quoting from it is an oxymoron. It's irrelevant. It has no authority. It has no power. It, it does nothing for you. You need to take the book and go throw it in the trash. Because in your mind, that's basically all it's good for. Until you come to the place where you realize 
Yes, the Bible is accurate. Yes, the Bible is true. And again, people are going to go out there and they're going to argue accuracy. I've been in that argument. It's a waste of time. The Bible is accurate. The Bible is true. I can trust what it says and believe what it says because it never changes. And it came from someone beyond man. Men didn't just sit here and invent this. How could they? Go to every other book there is, which hardly any religions have one, but the ones that do, you find inconsistencies throughout the book. Where one portion will tell a story from one author and another one from another, and they'll reference each other incorrectly. The Bible is absolutely not that way. Every time somebody references something from even a thousand years or more before them, it's a perfect reference. So we can trust this book. Now, if that's the case, we can trust what this book says. So for all the people who don't believe this Bible, is this portion of the video isn't for you. Because you've got other work you have to do. You've got something you've got to take care of first before we can even have a discussion on this. But for all of you who do believe it, here's the wonderful thing we get from coming to that way of understanding. We get full access to the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit has to show us. We get full understanding. I say full, but it's to a greater or lesser degree, depending on what we're able to accept or receive. Knowledge about the realm adjacent us. Right next to us is another realm. At any point in time, you may be surrounded by a thousand angels flying around your car, following you in the room. You never know. We start to gain knowledge and insights into the Father and what His desires are, what His personality is, what His wants are. To our Lord Jesus Christ and what He is doing in all of creation. All of these things are found in this book nowhere else. All people will tell you that the other books talk about that. No, no, no. So horribly wrong. The Bible is enough. If you don't think the Bible is enough, or the Bible isn't enough for me, i got to go find some more stuff. No, the Bible is more than enough. And in fact, you can't possibly get an enough from this word. But as soon as they go to another book, you've lost them. There's nothing we can do. They need angels to guide them and protect them. But you know what? It is possible for us to push them out of the way and go our own way. And when we do that, it is a grave mistake. Let us stay in the word. This word and only this word. Because nothing else is canon. Nothing else is canon. Nothing else belongs in this book. And they'll tell you, well, they had this book and this book and this book in there. True. But then it dawned on them, wait a minute, we made a mistake. These books don't belong here. Gad the Seer, Book of Enoch. In fact, in the Book of Enoch, it says, do not include this in the canon. They took them out. These are the books that are supposed to be here. And it is only then when King James made his and had his assembled. And it's good. It's hard to understand, but it's good. Because of the, of the Queen's English. Well, nobody speaks that now. And a lot of people are very hardcore to the King James. Cool. Well, you know what? You know what would be easier? Instead of, it would be easier than learning the Queen's English. It would be easier just to learn Latin or Koine Greek and just go read the book. The, read the, the original original. Then you know for sure. But in all the people who have ever compared the notes, it always matches. So We have nothing to worry about. This book is accurate. This book is true. We can rely on it. We have 2,000 years of documentation that proves it. So let us believe what this word says about our God, about our Lord, about the angels and what they're doing, about what our role is in any of this, about what we're supposed to be doing, about what is going to happen. We can believe that. We can trust that. And it proves true every single time. There is never a moment when it doesn't. John Barnett over at DTBM, he's over in Israel right now doing tours. Or DTMB, I think. Um... He's over there now doing tours, and there's an obelisk over there. Because a lot of people will debate on the kings of Israel. Well, we don't have any proof of these guys. Yeah, it's on that obelisk. That he, was, he just put a video up about it. It's on that obelisk. 
there's actually a carving of what he looked like. Well, a loose carving and a bunch of writing proving who it is. We have pillars and scrolls and carvings all over the place that prove all this stuff that's in here. They're finding cities they never thought were real. They would say, oh, well, that story in the Bible is not true because we have no evidence that any of those places existed. And then we find it. Okay, well, there's a check mark against you guys that you, you said that wasn't true, and now it actually turns out it is. And funny enough, in any of the other cities that they've found, they've never found evidence of what happened to that city as the Bible describes. Because all the other cities, they just find cities. It's not it's something that had, that had nothing to do with the Bible. Yet this one had a specific character trait. Its walls fell down. I'm talking about Jericho. They used to think Jericho was a fake city. It never existed. That's a, a made-up story in the Bible. And then they found the city of Jericho. And the city of Jericho has something that none of the other cities have. Seismic damage to its walls. They said these walls fell. And they stood them back up and had to brace it up. We, we, find, we find all the evidence of it. And we know it's Jericho because... The name of the city is everywhere. And they were shocked. There's another one. There was another city. A city that David had hidden in. Just in the last, This is just in the last four years. A, a city that David hid in. When he was running from... Uh, I forget what the guy's name was. Hiding from him. They said, well, we have no evidence that that city actually exists. So we can... They're, they're looking for any excuse they can. Oh, well, in the last four years, they found that city. Quite literally. Well, we have no evidence of, of Jesus ever existing because we don't see his name anywhere. His name's everywhere. They got his name all over the place over there. How do we know? Because Yeshua is a common name for Joshua over there. How, how do we know that it's actually Jesus? Well, you don't put Messiah next to just a random guy named Joshua. And that's what they did. Yeshua HaMashiach, Messiah. So we can believe this word is true. And I can keep going. There's so much more evidence. They found the Red Sea crossing. They found the path that the Israelites took through the wilderness for 40 years. They found the actual Mount Sinai with all the carvings and all the evidences and all the relics and everything stashed all over the place. They even found the platform where they built a golden calf. And that dude was big. That thing was very big. It's shockingly big. Over and over and over and over again, we find proof of every bit of this. We can believe this word is true with full confidence. See, I went and I looked. I saw the evidence. Actually, funny enough, most of it the Lord showed me. Showed me. I didn't go look for it. He brought it to me and proved that it was true. And now I'm an advocate for this book. And I think that was on purpose. Because what do we see today? Most people denying this book. Why? Why would they do that? Because they don't want it to be true. They're terrified of it. And so instead of facing the facts, I'm just going to be like the little dog sitting at the table with a cup of coffee when the house is on fire going, this is fine. Everything's fine. When for them it isn't. I believe there are angels that are even even ministering to those people, trying to get them to see the truth, trying to get them to understand, and some of them just won't. And it's unfortunate. But what do we have over them? A different kind of heart, a different kind of awareness, a different kind of understanding, and that's from God. That's from Jesus Christ. So we were able to look at this, and it means something to us. It has value. It holds our attention. I can never get tired of going through this book, ever. The more I go through it, the more I'm enamored with it. Because this is my Lord in writing. And since I don't have him right next to me to grab a hold of, I have this book, which is him in writing. We're going to find that in John. John makes that very clear in the very first chapter. Wait, wait until we get in that. that there's so much there. There's so much there. It's incredible how much is there. 
it's going to take us a hot minute to get through the writings of John. Incredible. Incredible. So, we have these angels around us at all times. In the trials and tribulations that you're in, there's angels there with you. <sighs> a lot of them see these things that you're going through too. They're witnesses to it. You know how long, how, how long can a, 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 even an entity, like, like an angel, be in the presence of someone suffering and not start to have compassion for them? I think it's by design. I think it's by design. Because even if you can't experience what a person is going through, you watch it long enough and you can start to have compassion on them. And they serve the Most High God like we do, so... It's perfect. God is perfect. Our Lord is perfect. He knows what he's doing. So when you preach, when you read the word out loud, the angels hear you. And so when you're ministering, like what we're doing right now, you're ministering to them too. You would be amazed that when you're by yourself, you have a huge audience sitting around you listening. When you read this word out loud, it grasps the attention of all of creation. And when you pray, the whole world pauses to listen to the worship of God, the creator of all things. It's not because of you. It's because of him. Because he is worthy. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory. To lift you up and sing praises unto your holy name. Father, thank you for this holy word that you have given us. This word of truth that we can rely on. The more sure word. Above everything else. The more sure word. I thank you for this devotion. Again, you let us here on purpose, obviously, because it opens so many wonderful avenues of discussion. Opens awareness. So, I mean, it's obvious to me you're doing a work through this. For me and for everyone else listening. Because I get something out of it, too. I learn, too. And so, what you're doing is just beyond mind-boggling in its perfection. Incredible stuff. Incredible. Father, you are worthy of our worship and our praise. You are worthy of all glory. Lord Jesus, what you did on the cross... The literal heights of love, of compassion, that you dealt with sin, and, and that's it. It's done. It's dealt with. It's over with. Now we can focus on more, much more important things, like getting people into the truth, getting people to come around and believe, getting people to see things as they really are, and your word helps us with that, and you sent angels to minister to us constantly. And how perfect that they minister to us every day, all day, and at night. They protect us and watch over us. And when we're reading your word, we're preaching right back to them. We're ministering right back to them. How incredible. How incredible. And what must they think when they hear this word being spoken by one of your children out loud? What does it do for them? How does it affect them? And does it, does it, is it making a positive impact? Do they even need to hear it? And I, I wonder about these things. Did you arrange this so perfectly that any time one of us reads your word out loud, it, it ministers to all of creation, whether in this realm or the other one? Well, your word seems to indicate that, that we preach to angels too. Preach the word to all creation. Animal, mineral, vegetable, spiritual. Now, do not let us become high-minded on this, Father, because we're just doing what we've been given to do. We're just sharing what we have. If this word grasps a hold of my heart and my attention so amazingly. And I loved that I'm able to share it, that you've trusted me enough to share this word with the world. But I know for as many people that are hearing it on this channel, 
a thousand more celestial beings are hearing it on the other side. Incredible and amazing. That boggles my mind. That, that completely flabbergasts me to consider the possibilities. But it proves your word more and more that all will end up hearing it. Every ear will hear this gospel. It is great. It's wonderful. Now, the angels don't need to hear it because they're there. They see him. They see our Lord right there. Or do they? Just like we do. You know, a, a Christian can't hear the gospel once. They must hear it every day. They must hear it all the time. I wonder if it's the same. And your word, I don't know, your word seems to indicate some of these things. Lord, I'm just going off what your word says. Correct my understanding if I'm incorrect. But if that is the case, make us to preach this word with fervor, even if we're by ourselves. Make us to realize that these angels are helping us and that we need to fight as much as they fight. They fight for us. We need to fight against the evil that they're trying to protect us from. We need to fight for truth. Make their efforts worthwhile. Instead of us wandering away, like Hebrew says. Make us to stand tall in this faith. Make, make us to make what the angels are doing for us and the ministering they're doing for us mean something. Make us to realize and, and, and to believe and, and to grasp a hold of these things. Prove them with your word and, and have this as our understanding. Because there's so much more going on than what we realize. There's so much more. But again, let us not make all these other things are focused, but instead make you our focus, because all knowledge and wisdom comes from you. So again, I'll glorify you in that this day. I will thank you for that this day and praise you for this wonderful work you're doing in all of our hearts. How amazing at this time with what's going on in this world, look at what you're doing in your church. It is incredible and remarkable to witness how many people have changed so much over the years. And how you have drawn us into a focal point collected us all into a pillar, maybe a few pillars. And as few as we are, look at what you do on our behalf. Father, thank you for this privilege and this honor to be treated as sons, to be called the sons of the Most High. That even though we live in this deplorable state, even though we still live in this flesh of sin, you still call us sons. So make us to act like sons. Make us to know this, believe it through your word, that the Holy Spirit will confirm with the word, and that we can walk forward in that knowledge. Not for high-mindedness, not for pride, but for truth, for praise, glory, and honor to you, for thanksgiving, and to share the gospel with others and help them see, help them understand, help all of us come into your truth, not ours, not the world's, yours, always yours. So this morning we glorify you, God. Lord Jesus, this morning we praise you, we give thanks, we honor you with this prayer, this video, with this life that we're living. May we do this every day as much as possible. We thank you for your mercy and your grace and your great love. We thank you for your free gift of salvation that you have given to all of us through Jesus. In his name we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for joining me for morning devotion. I love these devotions because they get us off on other subjects that we wouldn't normally discuss. But look at the details we can find in here. And it's, it's right there in the text. But sometimes we need him to open our eyes to see it. And when we do, using discernment, using self-control, when we do, we look at it for the truth that it is and move forward in that. Are we to worship angels? Absolutely not. Don't worship those angels that are ministering to you. Worship the God of those angels. Because like John, when he was trying to worship the angel, quote-unquote, that was escorting him around, turned out it wasn't angels, one of the prophets, He's like, hey, don't do that. Worship God. All this comes from him. 
And I think when God gives us this stuff, it reinforces his authority. It reinforces what our focus should be. He's bringing us back into focus every day. New grace, fresh grace. He's bringing us back into focus every day. So let us continually stay in focus. Stay in this word of truth. And pray always. And believe always. And never do what the world is trying to get us to do. To turn away. To wander away. I saw a video this morning. Oh. This poor woman has contracted Bell's palsy. And she got it two weeks after her second vaccine shot. This is a known condition that happens. It's all over the CDC's website. It's all over the WHO's website. There's tons of studies on it. But her statement was so shocking to me. She says, you know, even though this has happened, and she was pretty bad. She was in bad shape. There's no cure for that. She says, I would gladly do it again because it's for the greater good. People are so deceived today. People are so deceived into doing horrendous acts because they've been convinced it's good for them. How many people do this with the Word of God? How many people, well, it's better if we just accept abortion. It's better if we accept the act of homosexuality. It's better if we accept all these things that God says are sins. It's better that we accept them. Better that we just open the doors and let people come in and tell them it's okay. God loves you anyway. Well, just like the Bible says, love the sinner but hate the sin. Anyone who is in that boat where they have not been, in, been brought into Christ, they have not received what he has offered, they have not become saved, are an enemy to God. The Bible makes that clear. The deception is, is that anybody can be let in. Heaven is not Walmart. It doesn't have sliding doors. You know, I was alive at a time when department stores and even some Walmarts had revolving doors. In, out, in, out, in, out. Incredible times. And all those things from the past that I remember are so applicable now because a lot of people think Heaven is a revolving door. I can go in, I can get my glory on, and I can walk out, and everything's fine. And they will call that church they go to, there's heaven. I went in, got my Jesus on, and I left. And you you can't get more heretical. Heaven is not a revolving door. You go, you stay. The sheepfold is not, uh, you can go hang out and then bounce and go somewhere else. You go and you stay. But see, this is the deception today. Well, that's okay till you get to a part you don't like, and then you don't have to accept it. What are we going to do? Nothing. We're going to continue to read the word and preach the truth. If they won't hear it, we'll move on. We'll ignore them and move on. Find somebody that will. And until then, we'll preach the truth to the angels. To the creation. The animals love it. I know this. I've seen it with my own eyes. They'll come listen. The trees will listen. God is the one who's going to make the changes. Jesus Christ is the one who's going to turn people to him. Not us. We have no say so in that. That is up to him. But what we, the one thing we can't control is how we respond. How we move forward. And we do that and him leading us that way. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name. Let the angels do their work. They're, they're good. They have what they need. We don't need to get involved with them. Let them do their, their work. But what we can do is honor what they do by walking the path and following after Christ. I love you all very much. I bless you all. And I will see you in the next video.